Back to studio now and uh, this morning as I mentioned we are happy to host Transparency International here in studio. We have the founder of Transparency International Peter Eigen here with us as well as the chair Delia Ferreira as uh, they mark the 25th anniversary of Transparency International and the 20th anniversary of Transparency International Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for joining us thank on you. News Center this morning. Now, I began by introducing um, you know the corruption situation in Kenya as is. But Peter, let me begin with you. Very interesting, the Transparency International Movement idea at least began in Kenya. Tell us a bit ab about that. Yeah, at the time, 25 years ago, I was uh, the um, representative of the, of the World Bank here in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was um, the director of the regional office um, for East Africa. Uh, in Nairobi and I noticed at that time that many of the decisions which were taken uh, to select big projects, to design projects, uh, infrastructure projects, uh, big uh, hydropower programs, uh, pipelines, ports, railways, they were distorted by corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, by corruption which uh, at the time I noticed was systematically brought into the country by promoters of big projects from the north, you know, from Europe, from America, from Japan, right. from Canada. And, um, and I felt that we have to protect the people of uh, Africa against this kind of mismanagement because mm -hmm. a poorly designed program which takes hundreds of millions of dollars, very often billions of dollars, um, will be a tremendous burden for the economic development of the country. Right. And so I began within the World Bank to design a program uh, against corruption. And to my great disappointment, I found out that the members of the World Bank um, were um, not uh, willing to allow me to do this work because they felt at the time that corruption is something which is inevitable because there is no global government, there is no global governance, and therefore everybody was bribing and therefore very decent governments like the Germans, like the Brits, like the French, they allowed their citizens to systematically go out to, to bribe the decision makers in countries like Kenya, Uganda and uh, in fact in Latin America and Asia. Mm -hmm. And I thought this has to stop. And um, uh, when I did not get the permission to do this as director of the World Bank, uh, I had to leave the World Bank and I went to Germany and created Transparency International. And now, of course, uh, this has become a, a common fight. Uh, now the World Bank has totally changed. Now um, many of the countries are stopping their citizens for bribing outside. And I think this is what Transparency International managed to do. We have a very strong chapter here. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, they have uh, supported my work from the very beginning. And I'm very proud uh, to be here to celebrate their 20th anniversary while we at the global movement are celebrating the 25th anniversary of Transparency International. Absolutely and we will be getting uh, to the Kenyan chapter and what it has achieved so far mm -hmm. um, but Delia, like Peter mentioned it's not just a Kenyan problem it's a global no. problem mm -hmm. uh, but how much has Transparency International then been able to achieve since its inception 25 years ago? Well I think that the most important thing and we are now present in more than 100 countries in the world with our chapters there um, is to get the infrastructure to fight against corruption ready to go. Right. We have the conventions, we have the laws, we have the anti-corruption offices and agencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is important now is that we have to go to implementation. Right. Commitments are important, rules are necessary, but you have to put that in place and to move on to action and to monitoring what authorities and business persons are doing in terms to put a real stop to corruption mm -hmm. and also uh, to stop impunity, which is what is what we are seeing in many countries of the world. There is no institutional reaction against corruption and we need to stop that to send the right message. Mm -hmm. If you are involved in corruption, you will be punished. You will have to um, give back the money you have stolen for countries because the money that goes into corruption and um, private pockets uh, is the money that is uh, missing in education, health, 
development of mm -hmm, countries mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that is a big problem uh, but peter I even as you know we, we talk about that let's talk about the um, corruption perception index that the, it has gained quite a lot of uh, um, you know credibility across the world what does that mean to countries especially being listed in the way that they are well, I mean, to be quite honest, this was more or less a byproduct of our work uh, about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. We had a, a young uh, scholar working as an intern uh, in our Berlin office, and he said, I want to measure corruption. And I said, I don't have to measure corruption. I know corruption when I see it. Right. But he was an economist, so he wanted to measure it and want to quantify uh, what, what he saw. And um, therefore, he began... Uh, to use um, surveys which were made available to us free of charge uh, comparing the corruptibility of governments of various countries. And so suddenly he came up with a list of uh, 54 countries mm -hmm. and, um, and I said, well, this may be interesting for you. I don't really care about this quantification. I came from the World Bank where we had uh, quantified too many things in the past. Right. But uh, the interesting thing was that I received then a phone call from one of your colleagues in um, the Wall Street Journal in mm -hmm. New York. And he said, oh, Mr. Eigen, I see that you have an index. And so I suddenly had to shift and I uh, embraced this thing as a wonderful tool to create public awareness. And many governments now feel it is extremely important for them to show that they are improving on the index mm -hmm. rather than falling back um, as many African countries unfortunately do. Absolutely. And um, it was on that basis that we made this a very strong um, awareness building uh, instrument. But um, uh, many people know us only because of that index. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are doing many, many other things. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that the index, which mainly looks at the corruptibility of governments, is not really the main uh, thrust of our work. We look at corruptibility of the private sector, of the parastatal sector, of the um, academic sector, even of civil society sector. I mean, we are trying to find ways in which we can make corruption risky and uh, make sure that people uh, cannot do this with impunity. Absolutely. Um, Delia, several initiatives by Transparency International have many times shown the failure of most countries and most governments to significantly control corruption, leading to a crisis of democracies world mm -hmm. over. Uh, in your experience, how can that be remedied as we move forward before we get to well, Kenya's issue? Uh, our index, particularly and the research we have done for the show a great correlation between weak institutions and corruption. Mm -hmm. So we have to strengthen institutions and to make them really uh, working effectively in countries in order to stop corruption, to detect corruption, to prevent corruption also, to put in place uh, measures and mechanisms that uh, prevent conflicts of interest, for instance, or that monitor campaign financing, which is a big window of opportunities for corruption afterwards when uh, the candidates are elected mm -hmm. and have to pay back uh, the favors they received during campaigns. Right. So, and that's something occurring in many countries in the world. The, the important thing is that corruption may appear in any country. The difference between the well-positioned countries in our CPI, mm -hmm. in the, our, our index, and the ones that are much, uh, much uh, worst in that index is the reaction. Both the institutional reaction when corruption appears and also the social reaction against corruption. Mm -hmm. Citizens should be sending the right messages to politicians. We are not going to keep on voting those involved in corruption. Right. That's the right message. All right. And of course, um, it, it is a conversation that has gained momentum in the country, uh, with many now um, looking at what will be, will be delivered by those they vote for before they vote for them. Uh, but Peter, how impactful would you say Transparency International Kenya, the Kenyan chapter, has been? Because every year uh, we have you know, a report by TI detailing all these issues of corruption, but very little action um, from the relevant institutions on the same. Well, I mean, this is uh, really something where I shouldn't come from Berlin and pass a judgment about this. This is really the, uh, the responsibility in our system of the national chapter. They are the ones who do the, um, the diagnosis of the problems. Uh, they then develop, hopefully, 
cooperating with the government and cooperating with the private sector uh, prepare um, for reform proposals and they are the ones then to monitor whether these reform proposals uh, are actually implemented right. and I must say in, uh, there are very few countries in which we had such ups and downs in the success of this work um, uh, as in, in Kenya. I mean, we had times when we thought that uh, Kenya was a model of the world in terms of uh, introducing an integrity system, the laws, the institutions, the policies which would stop uh, corruption. Uh, then sometimes it fell down again and corruption came back. So it is something which is a continuous process and, uh, and we have to, at Transparency International, leave this very much to our national chapters to, um, to uh, continuously fight for integrity in their country and it is them who uh, have to give you a judgment on how well we are doing. Uh, right now, of course, uh, the government, as many governments, I should say, are emphasizing how important it is to fight corruption. But it's easy for governments to say that. Um, uh, in fact, many companies say they don't bribe. Uh, civil society sometimes ex exaggerates uh, their messages. So for me the important thing is sort of a multi-stakeholder approach in which uh, these three actors of uh, governance, the government, the private sector and civil society organizations talk to each other independently. We call that antagonistic cooperation, you know, and uh, basically and then come to a, a, a common understanding on what, what has to be done. And I must say, during this very short visit right now here, um, I, which is a very nostalgic, wonderful experience after 25 years of absence, um, I have the feeling that Kenya is on the right, uh, on the right way. All right. And like you mentioned, it's not just about corrupt corruptibility of government. It's also about the private sector mm -hmm. and other sectors um, of, of the economy. Uh, but Delia, we talk about democracy. Democracy then puts power in the hands of the people. But several mm -hmm. reports we've seen, um, you know, report that, you know, the Kenyan citizen is just as corrupt as the government that they are complaining about. Uh, how then do we begin to solve it from a societal angle? Well, I think that one important thing is to work in education and I'm not just talking about the formal education or the universities or the business schools we have to work from the very basic education uh, re reconstructing rebuilding the consensus in society about what's right and what's wrong mm -hmm. because when those consensus are strong the you don't need uh, an ethic or public ethic law that says in Article 2 uh, public officials must be honest. Mm -hmm. If you have to put that in a law, you have a big problem in terms of what are the ethics in society mm -hmm. as a whole. So I would really invest in education in order for the next 55 or, or whatever years we can consider solve really the problem mm -hmm. because if we don't go to the basic of the problem to the values problem we will keep on talking about rules policies etc without solving the root which is integrity values honesty mm -hmm. in the whole society mm -hmm. not just politicians politicians uh, don't come from another planet <laughs> they are parts of our society Absolutely. our students our partners our neighbors and uh, so we have to recreate the social consensus of the importance of integrity in mm -hmm. our society. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I may add a little um, anecdote uh, about Kenya, um, uh, which illustrates how important it is that it is uh, from the top that you have to fight corruption, but also from the bottom mm -hmm. by creating the, the, the demand for good governance. Um, when uh, President Kibaki was elected, um, the policemen, in their customary way here in Nairobi, they stopped the Matatu and, um, and they said, oh, your light is not functioning properly, so you have to pay me something uh, so that I let you go. Um, so this was sort of the petty corruption which was customary uh, in, the, in the traffic here in, in Nairobi. Uh, but when he said that, the passengers came out of the Matatu and beat up the policemen and said, now we have elected President Kibaki on a on an anti-corruption platform, there is no more bribing right now, there's no more extortion like that. And uh, so very quickly, um, this message that there had been at the top, a uh, changing attitude, 
feeds itself into the, uh, the, the wishes the and the, really. the traditions and the, the, the behavior of the people and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a common fight where people have to be brought together, uh, not only top and bottom, but also business, uh, foreign business, local business, government in many forms, and civil society organizations which have this tremendous mandate to fight for a better world. Right. And many times we hear, even from our president, that corruption is not you know, a domestic problem, it's a global problem. Mm -hmm. And we've mentioned it's not a lack of legislation, it's not a lack of uh, institutions really, but what can countries like Kenya learn from the countries that are doing much better in your corruption index? Well, I mean, the problem is that in a globalized economy, in a globalized market, national governments have a tremendous difficulty to impose uh, good behavior. Um, to regulate a market which is beyond their geographical reach. Uh, very often the time horizon of the problems in the globalized economy, like climate change, like uh, uh, environmental destruction, human rights violations and so on, the time horizon of that is quite different from the time horizon of politicians who think about their re-election in a couple of years. You know, And therefore one has to simply accept that nation states do not have the capacity anymore to create a, f a fair global governance and therefore we have to bring in um, a civil society which has a global reach which has a longer time horizon and um, this means that um, what can be learned now in say stopping um, uh, secret uh, companies in, in Panama or in other tax havens uh, can be used by say a prosecutor here in Kenya when mm -hmm. they try to, uh, to, to retrieve stolen assets and so on. So there has to be a network in which nation states have to be supported by civil society organizations and hopefully the private sector because they are also the victims of corruption of their competitors. Mm -hmm. And so it's this global system which can lead to more integrity, more openness. But um, it is, of course, a very difficult thing, say, for a local government to do this by themselves. So we need cooperation between these uh, actors of, uh, of society, but also, of course, between different countries and different interests. And um, the interests right now, if you look at the trade wars which are going on between America and China and Europe and so on, um, they are very diverse and it's very hard. And I think people who say there's a lot of corruption coming from outside into the country, they are right. I mean, it is a world which is very poorly governed nowadays. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And we have to fight very hard to create um, the uh, sort of multi-stakeholder approach to create a better world. And I think Transparency International can play an important role to support governments. Uh, so the people who are say, yes, there's corruption coming into the country, um, they are right. But uh, we have to help them to uh, expand their reach and to do something to create a better, a better world which is more fair and more just and less bloody than the, the world which we have right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. And, and that being said, uh, many would view African countries or third world countries as being the most exploited um, in, t in terms of corruption. Uh, Delia, currently Transparency International Kenya is hosting the African Regional Meeting, bringing together more than 40 African chapters mm -hmm. uh, of Transparency International. They definitely have a lot to learn from each other. What is coming out of this meeting? Well, it's a collective exercise that we repeat yearly mm -hmm. in order to exchange experiences and also this year in particular we are discussing what we talk uh, what we call the vision 2030 mm -hmm. uh, scenario so we are trying to figure what the challenges and opportunities would be in the future for our fight for transparency mm -hmm. and to be ready and create the tools uh, appropriate to fight corruption for instance in in uh, a world where technology will play a very important role Absolutely. and many people t tells us okay technology will solve all the problems in terms of transparency mm -hmm. and corruption mm -hmm. but, but for instance and you have heard that but for instance blockchain which is a very famous uh, technology or, or fashionable technology nowadays is the technology in the basis of cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. and bitcoin cryptocurrencies are protecting anonymity of the sources and beneficial owners of the account. So 
if we are fighting corruption, and we have said for many years, follow the money and you will find the yes. scheme, mm -hmm. and you introduce a technology that protects the anonymity of the origin of money or the destiny of the money, you are having a big problem. Mm -hmm. So we have to be ready to use technology in order to enhance transparency, openness, information for the people, but also to be ready to hold these technologies to account. Absolutely. And this has been a conversation in Kenya as well, uh, the regulation perhaps of uh, fintech or financial technology, mm -hmm. um, which really is the future. Even as we wind up, Peter, um, you know, uh, Delhi has touched on this. What are the future prospects for fighting corruption for Transparency International? Well, I think the, um, the approach which has been followed so far has to be adapted to these new technologies, to a world which uh, is divided in various blocks and so on. And we have to catch up uh, with the corrupt because they are very smart. Um, they have um, partners in law firms in, in London and Frankfurt and in, in New York and so on. So they do everything to de defeat what, uh, what the world really wants, uh, the, the world of, of integrity and of honesty and of fairness. So in a way we have to uh, follow this and have to be even a bit ahead of it. So far we have been very successful. I think the international corruption has become a, a consensus uh, that it has to be um, uh, controlled, uh, which was not dreamt of 25 years ago. I never would have thought that we would have been so successful. And I'm sure that we will be successful to be ahead of the game of the corrupt people and uh, create a world of integrity and peace and, and justice. Uh, for future generations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 25 years later, after you began this movement, uh, you know, an idea born in Kenya, you come back to Kenya, more than 40 chapters which are born from your idea um, are here today. Your final comments on how the experience is for you? Well, it is personally for me a wonderful uh, satisfaction. I, I met um, uh, some of the people who helped me in the very beginning. I remember the wonderful um, uh, Joe Githongo, uh, the father of John Githongo, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, met with me once a week to discuss how we can create something like that. He will be very happy to see how his son, for instance, is continuing uh, this battle. I met uh, Harry Smule, uh, one of the powerful leaders um, uh, in, in Kenya. Now these are models for the world and I uh, I'm quite um, optimistic that um, the present leadership will also be able to fulfill some of the promises uh, which is making in terms of uh, creating more integrity and fighting corruption Absolutely. in Kenya and in East Africa and in Africa and in the world. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and especially in Kenya. Um, yeah. Delia, your final <laughs> comments really um, or, 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 on, on what lessons the Transparency International Kenya chapter is likely to learn from this annual meeting? I think that all of us will learn in this meeting mm -hmm. because this is a collective exercise. It's not one country in isolation. Mm -hmm. It's a global problem and we have to work together in order to put a stop to corruption because in fact what we fight uh, for is freedom and peace and good democracy, solid institutions in order to have a better life for all of us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for speaking to us. That is Delia Ferreira who is the chair of Transparency International. Also with us here is Peter Eigen who is the founder of the Transparency International movement in the country to celebrate 25 years since the establishment of Transparency International and even as the Transparency International Kenya chapter marks 20 years of existence. That conversation brings us to a short break on News Center. Do stay with